Good afternoon, um, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks very much to the Forum Organising Committee for inviting me here for the first time. Let's hope it's not the last, so thanks for that. So anyway, today we're going to have a look at probably around five years of our research into equine stereotypic behaviour. In particular, we're going to focus on how changes in brain function can lead to the manifestation of these repetitive, abnormal behaviours that we call stereotypies. And I'm going to concentrate for most of my talk, I guess, on crib biting, but towards the end of the presentation, we're going to move more towards the locust, locomotor stereotypy known as weaving. And I think it's really crucial, whenever I'm kind of banging on about um, brain receptors in the laboratory, I think the, the, the overriding narrative here is that I always try to make it applicable to the way in which we manage horses the way in which we train horses. Otherwise, what's the point of the research in the first place? So ultimately, guys, these are my aims and objectives. From a management standpoint, we're going to have a look at feeding and how feeding relates to brain function and how crib biting often relates from inappropriate feeding practices. Then for the second part of my presentation, this is an interesting one, really, because... Um, the alterations which give rise to crib biting and weaving, um, we think, will also have a significant impact on the cognitive profile of the animal, the way that animal learns. So we're going to have a look at um, the cognitive changes that are associated with crib biting and weaving and make some recommendations for the proper training regimes of those animals. So anyway, on to topic one, feeding in relation to brain function and crib biting behavior. First, a quick run through a couple of brain structures, which are absolutely pivotal to the stereotypic motor response. And we'll start with this one here, the ventral tegmental area, known hereafter as VT. A. It's an area of the midbrain. It manufactures and releases a signaling molecule, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine is released from the ventral tegmental area. Its primary target is dopamine receptors on a second brain structure called the nucleus accumbens and the dopamine binds to specialised dopamine receptors on the nucleus accumbens. So how is this circuitry, which is pivotal to the control of stereotypy, how is this circuitry influenced by feed? So a closer look at the VTA and nucleus accumbens. One of the best ways to stimulate stimulate crib biting behavior is to give that horse a small quantity of a palatable food such as sweetened coarse mix and so let's imagine we've fed a palatable food in response to a palatable food a secondary class of neurotransmitter is released and we refer to this second type of neurotransmitter as the endogenous opioids some of you will have heard of endogenous opioids, such as the endorphins. Well, when we eat a palatable food, something we like, such as chocolate, many areas of our central nervous system will be flooded by endorphins. And so, in relation to stereotypic behavior, we see the arrival or the feeding of a palatable food, release of our opioids, including the endorphins, and they will bind to specialised opioid receptor molecules on the ventral tegmental area, causing it to activate. In response to this activation, the VTA transmits dopamine, and that dopamine binds to its receptor targets on the nucleus accumbens. 
causing the nucleus accumbens to activate. The behavioral upshot of this will be, on one hand, hyperactivity, but crucial to this argument, stereotypic behavior. And that happens in a range of species, uh, particularly the horse. So, if we inject a crib-biting horse with a drug called an antagonist that blocks these opioid receptors, so we're blocking those opioid receptors, we can more or less immediately abolish crib-biting. And this result led us to, to, to think to ourselves, we perhaps need to have a closer look at what's going on at the level of the opioid receptors. And so, over the past four or five years, we've been quantifying opioid receptors in the brains of crib-biting horses uh, versus the brains of stereotypy-free control horses. So we've been assessing opioid receptor density. And this is what we found. I'm going to draw your attention particularly to our two brain regions of interest, the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, and we don't just see a small increase in opioid receptors in the crib-biting horse versus the control horse. We see almost double the number. So there's no wonder feeding a palatable feed has this pronounced behavioral altering effect in the horse. And we've actually taken this and published this in a human preclinical journal um, because we felt it had broader ramifications than, than equine science alone. So um, in November 2018, we published this in the, the Journal of Behavioral Brain Research. But overall, what you've got here, guys, is a hypersensitized opioid mechanism at the level of the midbrain, the ventral tegmental area, and the nucleus accumbens. So, we feed a palatable food. Imagine what's going on up here. We've got the liberation of <laughs> endogenous opioids. So, the endorphins are going to be flooding that animal system. They're going to be binding to those sensitized receptor targets on the ventral tegmental area, dopamine transmission, and crib biting. Okay? Um, so, in terms of the best way to impact on this circuitry, I'm afraid it's very simple. We've got to try and feed horses um, rations that have lower palatability status. We need to be cutting down the concentrate feeds in these animals' diets in order to reduce stereotypy frequency. We should forget the crib strap, the electrified stable. The best way to bring down stereotypic behavior, particularly crib biting, is to cut down on the concentrates. We can make this work to our favor in many instances. Let's imagine that you're at a horse sale. Um, you're, you're, you're going to purchase a horse, or you're thinking of purchasing a horse, and you're thinking to yourself, this might be a crib biter. I've seen this animal gnawing at the stable door a little bit, but I'm not quite sure. The best way to find out. Small quantity of a palatable food, and that animal will beat its way to the nearest crib biting surface. So then, these brain structures, this neural circuitry, ventral tegmental area, nucleus, accumbens. It's also quite crucial to the control of various forms of learning. And we hypothesized that due to these altered pathways in the crib biting horse, we hypothesized that crib biters would learn differently. And we trained a group of crib biters, a group of weavers, and a group of controls to target a screen for a food reward. Really easy to teach cribbers, control horses, and weavers to do this. Okay, and you'll see the screen light up again in a second. 
this is a horse quite early on in the training, and you'll see the screen light up. He'll select the screen in a second. He was a little bit slow, and the food arrives in the hopper. Um, all horses, we could train to do that. Then we reprogram the device such that targeting the screen no longer resulted in food. And we quantified the number of unreinforced button presses that these horses committed or made. So in the absence of food reward, crib biters go on and on and on and on, <laughs> pressing that button. They're highly persistent. They're highly habitual. But for me, this data really gets interesting when we look at the rate of learning, the number of trials required to teach these groups of horses the initial screen selection behavior. The cribbers and weavers learn rapidly, significantly more so than the, than the control horses. So these horses learn quickly, cribbers and weavers. The problem is, with crib biters, the unlearning will be difficult. And it's crucial that we factor that in to our training regimes. So just to kind of draw all of this together. Overall then, folks, by reducing palatable concentrate feeds in the diet, we can reduce crib biting behavior uh, in a welfare friendly manner. One thing I think that we, we need to bear in mind, and if you look across some of the better studied species, the, the rodents, uh, for example, this type of change in opioid receptor populations is always stress induced. And if we're going to stop these receptor changes, from happening in the first place, the key thing is to keep the stress levels down. But I love, I love this data. Crib biters and weavers learn simple tasks quickly. And if I talk to top event riders, Andrew Nicholson being one, he almost favorably selects for crib biters because they do his job really well. They're the type of horse that learns quickly, it thinks quickly, and if he drops a rein in the middle of a difficult combination, they're the sorts of horse that'll get him out of bother. So I think we need to abandon the negative connotations that we sometimes apply to stereotypic behaviors. Um, with the caveat that crib biters, unlearning will almost certainly be difficult. And overall, as long as we adapt our training regimes, to bear this in mind, I think we can turn these behaviors to our advantage. So that's where I'll leave it for today, guys. I'd just like to finish by thanking my co-workers, um, my wife, Catherine Hale, who is in the audience today, but also Dr. Sebastian McBride and Matt Parker uh, from the University of Aberystwyth and Portsmouth, respectively. So thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Again, the same, if you can stand up. Any questions for Andrew? Over here. Jane Skepper from Horse IT. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, one question I'd like to ask you is, you say that stress uh, can start the receptors to be more responsive to cause the crib biting. Would it be fair to say that that then there's a genetic disposition for that to take place? We, we don't know in the horse, but if you look across the better studied species, uh, particularly uh, the, the studies which feature mice, there is a strong genetic link, a strong genetic link. And we've started to investigate that in the horse. Uh, at the moment, we don't have the appropriate funding, but there's quite a bit of anecdotal and a couple of studies which do suggest a genetic link. So I think you're absolutely right. It's not going to be genetic encoding of crib biting behavior. It's going to be genetic encoding of stress susceptibility. And, and, and I think it would be great to get to the bottom of that in the horse. It would probably need quite a lot of um, 
funding to do that. I don't know whether you know much about genomics, but it would require what we call a genome-wide association study, um, which, which doesn't come cheap, um, but, but certainly it, it's on my bucket list. We have a question there. Do I have to stand up? Right in front. Um, Jen Greenhouse from Myersco College. Um, today we've talked a lot of different subjects, but education has been a massive theme. I think everybody's kind of said what we need to do is improve education. To me, the presentation that you have just given has illustrated that humongously. Thank you. Um, the issue I have is helping students to go out there and not allow people to say that horses do stereotypies because they're bored. Mm. It makes perfect sense to me what you said, I'm sure it does to everybody here. Where are we going wrong where, where people are still saying horses exhibit wind sucking weaving and all that because they're bored? Yeah, I mean, um, boredom uh, is, is, is always going to be a factor, but it's ultimately the frustration that comes from boredom. So, for example, if you're maintaining a horse on a, a 70 to 30 diet of concentrate to, to forage, you're going to have an energised horse. You're, you're potentially going to have that as very, a very palatable ration that's going to be eaten quickly. So, undoubtedly, that animal is going to find itself in the context of a time vacuum in the stable. So, rather than boredom, which I agree is not a good way of, of, of describing causal mechanisms, frustration in relation to restricted feeding. I think that's one of the main ones, to be completely honest. But the other two that, that seem to be really crucial are social isolation um, and restricted locomotion. So restricted feed, social isolation, uh, restricted locomotion. Those are the big three as far as causal factors are concerned. But getting the message out there is, is really important because we still find ourselves in an age when there's a slight disconnect between the academics in the ivory towers and the people managing horses. And there's nothing I enjoy more is, uh, than talking at this kind of forum where, where my findings can actually have some impact. Down here. So, Tim Morris, I was going to put your findings to think. If you were buying a horse, an expensive horse, and you asked the vet what was in the pre-purchased drug scheme, would you like an opioid antagonist like naloxone in there as well? It may sound facetious, but it's actually a deadly serious question. Would you? Yeah, a bit of, bit of naloxone. Um, we, we've all watched um, Casualty on a Friday night or whatever it is, and if, if you see people with a, a heroin overdose, they, they fill them full of a drug called Narcan, which is naloxone, which is ex absolutely what you're talking about. And, and in horses... The study I referred to earlier, the opioid blocker study, that was naloxone. And it's exceptionally good at stopping crib biting. Exceptionally good. So maybe some sort of slow release cocktail. Um, but but I, again, I don't think pharmacological uh, intervention is the way forward. Right. I think on that note, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you.